Our topic for this session is the future of employer-sponsored health insurance. And I was tempted to rename it, is there a future of employer-sponsored health insurance? And maybe we can get uh, our two panelists engaged in a little bit of a dialogue as to whether or not they think that there is in fact even a future of employer-sponsored health insurance. And then of course, what might it be? Um, one or two data points, I think, for context of this conversation, and then I'm gonna invite Mark up first and followed by Zeke. Um, approximately 150 million Americans today are still getting their health care through an employer-sponsored uh, health insurance plan. So it really does remain the bedrock of our $2.8 trillion health system. I think that gets a little bit lost in some of the recent conversation and excitement over the Affordable Care Act because we're seeing individuals who are now coming into the market, they're shopping on those exchanges. That's a very different business model and a very different way to sell and purchase health insurance than typically the employer-sponsored model. And we'll dig into that a little bit. Um, I certainly think that at our Health Research Institute, we believe that there is a major shift occurring away from the current business-to-business, B2B model, if you will, over to more of that retail style, B2C, business-to-consumer model. But I think that the time question is very important to think about once you sort of say, okay, we see that trend occurring, but what is the timetable? When might there be a tipping point? Those are some of the things I'm hoping we explore in our, our conversation today. Employers today face some very big and difficult choices about the provision of benefits, including healthcare benefits, and those choices you might loosely put into the category of private insurance, a private exchange, public exchange, or stay where they are today. Or maybe there's a, a fourth category that I haven't thought of. So I know that Zeke is going to talk a little bit about the framing of those choices. Um, we will also talk about a couple of provisions in the Affordable Care Act that can influence employers today or in the next couple of years as well as some existing law. And so when employers are thinking about those choices that they face, what are the new regulatory provisions that might also influence uh, that decision making? So those are a couple of uh, parameters that I've suggested for our panelists, but I'm sure, I'm sure they'll both add more. I'm gonna ask Mark Pauly to kick us off, um, and just a, a personal note, Mark has always very graciously been a contributor to a report we do every year called Behind the Numbers, which is a forecast of the coming year's healthcare spending growth rate. And so we certainly at HRI are indebted and, and very excited to be here with him today. Mark. Thank you, Cece. Well, uh, so the question is, is there a future for employer-sponsored <laughs> health insurance? And as an economist, it's important for me to tell you my conclusion at the beginning of my remarks, because after I do the on the one hand, on the other <laughs> hand, when I get to the end, you won't know. Uh, so my conclusion is, under current law, as the uh, charismatic Medicare actuary would say, uh, I think actually the uh, future for employer-sponsored health insurance is about the same as the present. I see a modest amount of erosion. I'll explain why in a minute, but I don't see any enormous change. On the other hand, uh, if, uh, if, if I could uh, play the game that was played by the first panel this morning and say what I think ought to happen, <laughs> I think there ought to be some substantial changes from current law that, uh, if I'm right, will probably substantially reduce the share of uh, health insurance people get through their jobs. So I'll give you both answers, but uh, I, uh, I think there should be a change, but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't see strong evidence yet uh, that there will be, although I'll try to make a linkage between the two. Uh, uh, so I'm going to approach this like an economist. Uh, uh, I need to say, um, Henry Aaron calls the employment-based health insurance the American way of providing health insurance. <laughs> and as Cece mentioned, that's perfectly right as a descriptor. It's 92% of all private insurance is that way, and we're going to get a little more non-group insurance from the exchanges, but it'll still, if nothing changes, still be the American way. I, it's important for me to say I don't regard that as a, a, a judgment. It's just a description, uh, and, uh, and to my take, uh, what's important about judging health insurance arrangements is 
uh, based on their outcomes, uh, do they lead to lowest cost for whatever coverage people get, and do they lead people to choose the level of coverage that's appropriate for them, given that they face the true cost of health insurance? I guess that makes me an instrumentalist, and Zeke's an ethicist, uh, instrumentalist. I, I guess that's a sin, but I'll confess <laughs> that one. I'm an instrumentalist when it comes to health insurance. Uh, uh, two uh, economists' questions, assumptions about uh, employment-based health insurance. Uh, just to flag it, I, probably most people have heard this. We believe that workers pay for all of their health insurance almost no matter what. Employers cannot shift the burden of health insurance to workers because if they do, they're just going to have to pay more in money wages. And if they don't have to pay more in money wages, they're a poor excuse for a capitalist because they were overpaying their workers in the first instance. Uh, so we think that, uh, w that workers will uh, uh, that bear the benefits and the costs of any change in health insurance arrangements. And skipping a few steps, that means even if you're a uh, just a profit-maximizing firm or a, a compensation cost-minimizing firm, you want to choose the benefits structure that's going to basically make your workers as best off as they can be, and then you can capture a bunch of that in, in your lower cost. So, so that's the part we know for sure. Um, wrote a whole book on this, available in antiquarian bookstores, uh, uh, <laughs> called Health Benefits at Work, uh, which part discusses a lot of employers don't think that. We think you're wrong, employers, but I still want to hear from you. What I do want to hear from you about, though, is the part we don't know about, which is, what, how do employers decide what to do about health benefits? I just said they should be what workers, what's best for workers, when they have different workers for which different plans are best. How do you reconcile uh, the desires of your high-wage workers and your low-wage workers or your risk-averse and your less risk-averse workers? How do you do that? And I, I, I will um, flag that as something that makes it hard to predict the outcome of uh, 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 health insurance, uh, group health insurance. Uh, okay, well, to kind of go through the numbers here, um, if, if I think, it, so there are, um, uh, and I actually like them all, uh, most of them anyway, there are a lot of economic models, simulation models to predict what will happen to the employment-based system under, group, under the ACA, and I think most of them say it'll stay the same, or one even that I kind of like from Urban says it's actually more workers will be covered than before. Those models, if you read them, well, you can't. Even if you're an economist, it's black magic, uh, double, double, toil and trouble. So I'm going to try to tell you uh, what I think are the key uh, chunks of the population and the key assumptions about behaviors of those chunks of the population that are important. So just to kind of go through the numbers, 60% uh, um, is a number to begin with. That's approximately the proportion of the workforce that either gets group either gets uh, self-insured health insurance or experience rated health insurance that's effectively self-insured. And that population, I think, is pretty much bulletproof against any changes from um, from a health reform, at least if employers are rational. Um, I, that's the kind of company I've worked for all my life, the University of Pennsylvania. We have a wonderful benefits department in Northwestern. Uh, I count on them to choose a good set of benefits, and uh, they don't uh, ensure co competition is irrelevant to them because they're self-insured. I do have Blue Cross's name on the cheesy piece of plastic in my pocket, <laughs> but they're only the administrator, and unless the people down there are falling on, down on the job, I think they're, they're, they're bound to be able to offer a set of benefits to us that's better than any exchange could ever offer, so I don't see anybody defecting. Uh, and we also, in these large self-insured firms, tend to be on average relatively high income, so we don't have a lot of low-wage workers, although we have a few. I'll come back to them. To go to the other end of the distribution, there's about 20% of workers who work in small firms and mostly low-wage firms. Those are prime picking, I think, for movement to exchanges because, uh, for one thing, they, they do tend to be low-wage workers, which means that the uh, subsidy that they can get if they go to an exchange is much larger than the uh, tax advantage of excluding income from tax, since all they're saving is their payroll taxes, not any real tax. Plus, uh, the uh, efficiency advantage for group insurance at that small group level is really not that great, so there's not much to lose. So my guess, the, the law firms that were mentioned this morning probably <laughs> will stay with group insurance because they want to keep the 
payroll, the uh, uh, tax exclusion advantage, which they're not going to, thank goodness, get a subsidy in the exchange. But uh, although their clerks might, but uh, but most of the most of the people I think will go to the exchange. I guess about three quarters. Then uh, this is kind of the more interesting group. There's kind of the middle group, another 20 percent if you're counting, where they're middle middle-sized firms. Uh, will they go to the exchange? And here's this, this key set of assumptions. Are um, insurance offered in exchange likely to be better what, than what they could have gotten in the medium-sized group market? I'm pretty skeptical. The people running exchanges, they're nice people. They're great people. They're uh, either refugees from Medicaid or from, <laughs> from uh, the private sector <laughs> brokers and so forth. But, you know, they're the people who are on duty at Pearl Harbor. So uh, whether or not they'll be able to do a better job in the exchange than what they w were doing before, or is at least very much an open question to me. Second point, uh, there are a lot of surveys actually that show if you ask people, would you like to have more choice because in these medium to small groups usually you don't have much, they say yes, but they never say at what price. And here's a question I actually don't know the answer to. I poked around on this a lot. How much does it cost to add choice? Uh, my rough guess is about 5% of premiums, but I could be wrong. But, and then my intuition is uh, um, I don't think that uh, most people have that much of a dissatisfaction with what their current offerings are that they'd be willing to pay that kind of money to have more choices. Um, and given all the headaches that we heard about this morning, maybe they'd be smart to avoid all those choices. Uh, uh, the, the basic, and uh, nobody has come to me at Penn. They, they, sometimes stop them by my office. I'm thinking of putting in a confessional because they want <laughs> advice on, uh, 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 on um, private subjects about health insurance. Uh, but nobody said, gee, I really wish we had a cheap, narrow network plan here at Penn. So maybe uh, there may be, there may be somewhere. But so this group, I think, will mostly still stay with employment-based group insurance. Oh, and another, two other reasons why. One is there is the mandate penalty from the employer mandate. Generally, I don't think that's a big deal, but I think it will help to nail this group more or less into the employment-based setting because the argument that you sometimes said, well, your employer paying uh, $4,000, let's say, for your employee's health insurance now, you only have to pay $2,000 as a penalty by the magic of arithmetic, you should drop your insurance. But if you take the economist's view, you're gonna to have to pay people as your workers a lot of extra money to make up for the lost compensation and you, you'll end up behind unless the subsidy in the exchange is more than the, uh, uh, more than the, um, the uh, 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 difference in premium minus the original tax exclusion value, if you wanna calculate that. So most of the time, I think that's not gonna be true. And then there's this issue of, these firms tend to be more heterogeneous even if, on average, uh, workers were better off, meaning, say, the total amount of subsidies would be larger if we canceled our insurance, the question is, would we cancel our insurance? And just as an animal farm, maybe not all pigs are equal, not all employees are equal. Maybe the high-wage employees who will lose uh, account for more than the low-wage employees, not because it's an unjust world necessarily, but because they are what economists call the marginal workers, or they might be the ones that Low wage workers are a dime a dozen. High wage workers, you invested a lot in their training. You don't want them to leave. Uh, you care more about how they value health benefits others. Then there's the last group, about 16% of all workers, which are the currently uninsured. Uh, I think most of those will go to the exchange, and they should. After all, why did we set up the exchange? But in the urban model uh, and some of the other models, we do get uh, some non-negligible number of them, um, if you can believe this, going to the boss and saying, look, boss, we're not insured now and you're not providing it, but we're gonna get hit with this, this individual mandate penalty. Why don't you take away our raises for the next five years and then provide us with tax shielded health insurance uh, and that's how we'll get our insurance. And if they're high wage, you can see that's kind of a reasonable thing to do. So, so uh, some of the simulation models put some of those people in and I think in Massachusetts uh, that, that did pick up a fair amount of people. So the, the punchline here, my bottom line is, uh, what will be the erosion? I think it's gonna be 10% plus or minus 10% uh, from the employment-based market. Why should it be more? Uh, well, it has to do with actually something I think that will happen in the longer run. David Brooks actually mentioned this in one of his columns during Obamacare. Uh, the low wage, there aren't that many low wage workers in large firms who don't get health insurance now. 
So the mandate, that's why the mandate doesn't matter too much. But uh, there are a lot of low wage workers who do get health insurance and we think they are really taking it in the neck financially by having to sacrifice as part of their wages the whole amount of the employer contribution and maybe then some. And the tax break they get for that is only this paltry exclusion. And then they're looking at their evil twin, Skippy, who worked for a small firm and is going into the exchange and getting a 50% or more subsidy in the exchange. The, the temptation is to see, can't we get that hands on that kind of money? And the way to do it is, of course, to spin off your low-wage workers into separate janitorial or administrative assistant firms. That I know there are rules to prevent this kind of shenanigans, but I have great confidence in Americans' ability to shenanigate. <laughs> uh, that, that, that it will actually happen, and there will be gradual erosion that way, and there should be. And I guess my position, again, this is easy for me to say because I have tenure, is to say we, we should uh, pay the same subsidy to people regardless of how they get health insurance if they get qualified health insurance. So that could mean if we're offering a $2,000 subsidy to 200% of poverty line person in the exchange, everybody who works has that kind of income should get $2,000 subsidy. Uh, uh, where will that money come from? Well, it's of course part of my overall scheme to reform things. Let's cancel the tax exclusion, take my tax exclusion please, and use that money to pay for the subsidies to people who really need it. I actually think there's uh, uh, not, as uh, Cece said, three options, uh, which is stay as you are, private exchanges or public exchanges. I think it's two options and they're slightly different. So one, in, one option is, uh, I like to call it all in. And uh, it's not just are you offering health insurance, but I think there's gonna be a set of employers uh, that uh, are offering health insurance, have a wellness benefit, and have this, are gonna go all in, which includes things like they're gonna begin offering primary care clinics at their work site, dental clinics at their work site, pharmacy benefits, they're going to have uh, wellness programs, including worksite uh, uh, fis uh, fitness facilities and a pretty big uh, wellness initiative. And they're going to restructure their benefit programs um, around uh, getting people to use these services and getting them uh, much more engaged. That's a big lift. It's a much bigger investment than many firms are doing uh, today. Uh, it's the next step. Uh, I think, but firms that have done this, I think, have had a pretty big positive response uh, when they've done it well and have had some experience on it, and I think you're going to see a um, uh, pickup of this because you can control better, uh, you can reduce uh, absenteeism for health visits if you have on-site primary care and dental clinics, you, you can uh, control uh, pharmaceutical costs uh, a little better if you've actually got the pharmacy there. Uh, there, you can do a lot more to encourage the wellness activities. And if you've got the benefit design, um, uh, I think that can help. You then have to obviously contract out and make sure you have an efficient tertiary care providers. That's not for everyone. Uh, it obviously requires an infrastructure, requires uh, good HR and other departments. On the other hand, I do think that over time, it's going to behoove companies uh, that don't do that and don't want to go all in to think about all out. Why are they doing health care in the first place? Uh, can their workers get better choices uh, in the market uh, if the, again, with the caveat that the exchanges work, they're appealing, uh, the network effects and the buzz around them are uh, better. Um, and I think for uh, many firms, uh, it allows more predictability, they will do a defined contribution uh, kind of arrangement uh, and uh, that will allow them to have you know, more control over health care. So I actually think, again, we won't see this for the next few years and it does depend upon certain things like the exchange is really becoming much better. But I think that's how we're going to see most employers evolve. Either they're going to go all in really do health care uh, seriously with their own clinics, uh, their re really comprehensive redesign of their benefits, much more investment in wellness um, than the sort of token uh, items, 
or they're going to say, this really isn't in our wheelhouse, this isn't all that interesting, it's not really necessary to retain our workers or for golden handcuffs. Um, and I think those are really the choices uh, that we're going to see now. But uh, that's the way I see things evolving over the next few years. And I don't have an economic model to back it up. Every employer that we hear from talk about, they all talk about that Cadillac tax. Um, so they're, they're exceedingly focused on it. Um, but is there not another reaction to the Cadillac tax, which is to turn around and say to insurers and healthcare providers, you've got to be lower cost? Mark. Yeah. So uh, I'm in favor of the Cadillac tax. Uh, you and are? I thought you didn't like it. No, it's uh, not as good as uh, taking away the tax exclusion entirely, but it's, we take what we can get. <laughs> um, but that was my thought, too. It, its purpose it is to cause, cause, first of all, it's not going to be paid by employers. It's going to be paid mostly by workers. Uh, those employers who can't get under, who aren't as able to deal with it, will, will probably suffer a little. But generally, uh, it will be paid by workers if... Uh, the cost of coverage exceeds the limit, but the whole point of this is kind of like disciplining your children. You don't <laughs> want to have to ground them, because who wants them around the house? You, uh, <laughs> you, you want them to stop that behavior, and in this case, the behavior is overly generous health insurance coverage. So the way to get under the Cadillac tax is to move to higher deductibles and out-of-pocket payments. So you can also get there, it's okay with me, if it's to your taste, by signing up with a Rambo HMO, or whatever it might be, but you're supposed to get under it. You're not supposed to have to pay it. Uh, and that's supposed to contribute, of course, to our social objective to uh, control the rate of growth of health spending. And uh, I, uh, uh, of course, part of the complaint from employers is that they do think it's their money. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we think they're wrong, or at least if we're right, if we're wrong, labor economics and Larry Summers are wrong, but that could, <laughs> both could be true. But, uh, but um, uh, so I think uh, that, that, um, that it will, uh, I think most employers, uh, well, it's kind of like what you were saying about when costs were rising rapidly. They complained bitterly, but they didn't do anything. Now costs are rising less rapidly, so they're not complaining, but they're still not doing much of anything. <laughs> so you, you don't want to judge too much by what people say. You want to look more at what they do. I think what they should do, according to me, uh, and I think what most will do, is figure out how to restructure their benefits. After all, it's only the premium that has to get under the tax, not the total cost of health care to your workers. So I, I think they'll do that, and I think you know we'll be a happier country on average uh, because of it, although not necessarily those high-wage people who worked for firm who really desire very generous health care coverage of new and costly, but not that beneficial technology after all, is who we're after, right? So, Mark, you started to anticipate my next question, which was, what are the current strategies that employers are using today? So the most obvious one to say is what I just said. There's been a substantial movement toward mm -hmm. high-deductible health plans. Uh, it's not per my personal favorite. I kind of view them like earrings for men, you know. I, it's <laughs> fine for people who like that sort of thing, not my preference, but... but, uh, uh, but hang on. I, I want you to talk more about why you don't like it, because I would have expected you to like those earrings. Well, uh, so I like them for a lot of other people, but uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of back to this morning's discussion. Uh, with a high enough income and enough good luck in life, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think there's more important things than minimizing your health care costs, your health insurance costs, if you are willing to pay extra, and I am. I married a doctor's daughter, too, so that's probably part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think, but, but for a lot, of, for people who do, uh, and, you know, I realize how lucky I am and how many other people are uh, much more financially constrained, this is a way uh, to uh, limit your, not just your, uh, limit your total spending, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> from what I know, it seems to be pretty effective. Uh, uh, there are some concerns about having very low-income people take out high-deductible health plans, so I'd be willing to have the law changed and say they're not allowed to. Only people with incomes above a certain level can take advantage of the HSA and all of that. We'll see how that goes, but, but, uh, but I think it's reasonable. Um, just to throw something else out, though, that I've, I've been wondering about is uh, we have, uh, I call this the two trains on the same track. 
we have high deductible health plans coming down the track, and we have coordinated care coming down the track. And what does coordinated care look like with a high deductible health plan? Uh, if somebody has a, 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 even an anecdote or experience with that, I'd love to hear it. But, uh, but I, th I think it, it is the most obvious thing to do. I do think that there are ways to ramp, amp, ramp up or amp up managed care. And then, I, I'll, despite what I said about narrow networks, um, at least in the short run, uh, I think they're likely to be effective. Cosmically, uh, if you want to slow down the growth of spending, you have to slow down what's driving the growth of spending, which is not sort of static inefficiency. It's what I was just making remarks about. It's adoption of costly, beneficial perhaps, we hope, but not that beneficial new technology. And I have made some suggestions along that score about how an HMO could structure itself to tell consumers up front what its um, adoption policy will be for new technology. And if people want to save money, they can choose the HMO that um, has a low dollars per quality threshold for approving new technology. So Zeke, as the yeah. physician, I, I do want to get your view on what seems to be two contradictory trends today. One is toward high deductible, and one is the movement for care coordination. Can those two coexist? Well, I, I think partly, the question is uh, whether uh, whether we are going to get good integrated delivery and uh, whether high deductible plans are a transitory uh, situation or they're a permanent uh, feature. Um, because I do think there is a model, which I think is going to become the dominant model, but uh, here again it's a prediction, which is um, there is, uh, you know, 85 percent of what we spend is on people with chronic illness and doing better uh, on people uh, managing their care uh, is going to be very important. And there are a bunch of buckets and ways of actually managing their care better to save uh, a lot of money. And I think also saving that money sends signals upstream about the kind of technologies that will be adopted and utilized. Um, so I think there is a way in this kind of model where we are going to get to care coordination, but it does require payment change. We have a lot, a lot of experience. ACOs are but one. Bundled payments are another. They're going on in Medicare. They're going on in the private side. Lots of them are going to fail. Um, so someone's saying, well, you know, we, we have all these programs, the Pioneer, and only a few people make money. And yeah, of course, you know, venture capitalists doesn't expect 100 percent success. You know, they, they'd be happy with 20, 25 percent success. Same thing is going to happen in uh, a lot of these models. But uh, I do think we're going to find solutions. We do have to ha accelerate that process, and I think that process has to be both public and private. Um, but assuming we get that change, I do believe that there's a fair amount of savings possible uh, on those arrangements. And that also makes me believe that the high deductible plan is going to be a transitory model if we can get this integrated delivery system working uh, then there's going to be a lot of incentive to change what those deductibles are to incentivize adhering to these guidelines and practices and to charge the deduction on other kinds of uh, activities that are more discretionary, less uh, highly beneficial. Mark, in particular, I, I was with you until you got to the mid-sized employer, and I want to probe on why you think they are more likely to stay in the employer-sponsored model. I, and I say this in part because when we talk to the medium-sized employers, they don't necessarily feel that they have the infrastructure or the bargaining power to really do well in this current environment. That may be, I, I think it's primarily because of the, the penalty from the employer mandate. Okay. That's what free, freezes them in place. Uh, you know, in my Nirvana scenario of uni, uni, uniform incentives, I suspect there would be an awful lot of erosion there. But we've, with the uh, employer mandate, we've, we've kind of frozen uh, the, those in, in, uh, in that particular way of doing things. Okay. Well, uh, but but here, uh, here I think there's a combination of poli policy changes that probably don't require legislation uh, and other things where you might change it. So if, if medium-sized employers could give a a voucher, essentially. We're going to pay this amount of money, and you go into the exchange uh, uh, and buy your insurance. And that were treated equivalently uh, um, 
and they didn't have a penalty. That was their, mm -hmm. their uh, contribution. I think that's one thing that would incentivize them. And I think for some of them, even with the $2,000 per worker penalty, um, I think even for many of them, uh, at some point the hassle factor and the price is going to be such that they will. That's why I, 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 think, I think Mark's right till 2018 and then I think, again, a set of dynamics are probably going to uh, flow into place. Um, I have a, a couple of takeaways that, that I heard from the two of you here in no particular order. An expectation that the employer-sponsored health market is going to remain stable for the next few years. An observation that the Cadillac tax is a big <clears throat> deal. <laughs> Surprising agreement between these two that uh, a significant portion of the employer-based market will remain for quite some time, whether it's Zeke's all in or Mark's delineation of the, the different percentages there, which I think is a little bit contrary to what, um, what some of the chatter out there on the street is. And finally, I think we all have to ask Dan to bring us back because there's a lot more to discuss. But thank you to my panelists. <laughs>